Welcome back. You're still watching Shape Your Life, the show that teaches you everything you need to know about health-related matters. Treatment for hypertension includes both prescription medication and healthy lifestyle changes. If the condition isn't treated, it could lead to health issues, including heart attack and stroke. Early detection is so important. Regular blood pressure screenings can help you and your doctor notice any changes. Dr. McKay, thank you so much for joining us once again on Shape Your Life. Nice to be here. When it comes to the heart, the heart is you know, the most Im one of the most important organs in the body. And many people neglect it and they only realize something is wrong when they go to their doctor and they get told, yo, you have high blood pressure, also known as hypertension. What is it and why is it so serious? Okay. So you start off very well because the, the, the main issue around the heart is that it causes silent disease. It's a silent killer. And especially with regard to the pressure, and things like cholesterol. You are not going to feel any symptoms, or the lucky ones will feel something necessitating a visit to the doctor. Otherwise, it may just be found by accident. So just because you feel well or look well doesn't necessarily mean that your heart is well. So that's a very good point. So basically, blood pressure is the pressure that your heart generates within the cavity in order to pump blood out to the rest of your body. So if there's any resistance, and this resistance can come from the arteries itself, against the flow of that blood, that creates a certain pressure. So the normal pressure that we have in our blood is around about 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. But there's a range. And so once that pressure elevates to beyond 140 for the top, mm -hmm. the systolic, that's the pressure generated with the first contraction, and then the diastolic, 90. So anything above 140 over 90 would be regarded as high blood pressure or hypertension. So that's essentially the definition of it. Why is it such a serious thing to be concerned of? So, Every day that your heart or your pressure is elevated above normal, it is increasing your risk of a few things. One, heart attacks. Two, strokes, which is really a brain attack. Mm. Three, heart failure, where your heart muscle becomes so big and flabby, it's powerless to pump, and it just fails, and fluid accumulates all over the shop. It can damage your eyes, hypertensive retinopathy, can even damage your kidneys, hypertensive nephropathy. And, and one of the biggest cause of people being in a renal unit needing dialysis is hypertension. So it can co affect most of the organs of the body and is a very, very serious condition. So are there any particular signs and symptoms that we could be aware of when we at home in order to go see the doctor in any case, go and see a doctor, this is what you, you, you could be suffering from? So anyone, anyone who is um, who has headaches that are unexplained, you could most likely have it. But as I said, by and large, it's a silent disease. Therefore, we need to be aware of the risks. Okay. So as we're getting older, your blood pressure can go up. So just by virtue of getting older, we need to have our blood pressure checked. Anyone who is overweight potentially could have high blood pressure. Anyone who is inactive could potentially has, have high blood pressure. Anyone who eats a high salt diet could potentially have high blood pressure. So there's no target groups. Younger ones are generally uh, safe from that, although it should still be checked. It can happen in, 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 in kids as well. So the risk factors essentially, that those are the things that you should look out for. It, diabetics, those patients who have established chronic disease are at high risk. Family history, if someone in your family has had high blood pressure, you need to know about it and keep on measuring and checking your blood pressure. What about the treatment here of? Is it purely medication based or is it a lifestyle modification? Okay, so as with most chronic diseases, it's medication plus lifestyle, okay. all right? Maybe with the mild uh, patients, mild hypertensive, we may just institute some lifestyle management. Lifestyle is very critical, but it's not be all. And every, everyone, and there's a whole um, movement, let's try and do it the natural way, let's stay away from these tablets. The problem is, without medication, you are not going to alleviate the risks. Okay, so with, as far as lifestyle is concerned, exercise, lose the weight, cut the salt out. And the salt is not from added salt. It's really the salt content in foods that we're buying off the shelf, such as your breads and your cereals. They already have a high amount of salt, so be careful of that. But medication is by far and away this is the mainstay of treatment. And usually we're even moving away from a single drug to dual drug, two drugs to control it. And what the drugs do, one, is to bring down the blood pressure. Now anything can bring down blood pressure, right? even the lifestyle. But it's more than controlling blood pressure. You have to control the risk or the, out the complication. So by taking a pill, yes, you're bringing down the pressure, but you're also lowering your risk of getting a heart attack, getting a stroke, or getting heart failure. And that's the importance of medication. Would exercise play a key role 
in, in preventing and if you do have hypertension, managing it? I can't emphasize more and you'll find in every time we say anything about medicine, exercise is the key. Exercise plays a key role in cardiovascular fitness. Keeps the heart fit so it keeps the blood pressure stable. It plays a key role once you are, have established blood pressure, you want to keep that heart fit and strong. And the benefit overwhelmingly is to help one lose weight, which lowers the, the amount of work that the heart has to do. I, my GP, Dr. Abdullah used to say, you can't expect a small engine to pull a big truck. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Our heart yeah. is there the size of a fist. So if you're 200 kilos, that little heart must pull that big body of yours around. So by lowering your weight and by exercising, you're increasing the fitness of the heart and its ability to pump blood. And therefore you extend the lifespan of your heart. Doctor? Pearls of, pearls of wisdom again and a really important information that has come through and what it boils down to is again being preventative to the best of our ability but if you do have hypertension seek out your doctor and adhere to the advice given. Absolutely, the, never, you never know when your blood pressure is high. Okay? So measure it, know your blood pressure, keep checking it and control it if you are on medication. Dr. McKay, thank you so much for once again spending your time with us on Shape Thank Life. you very much, thanks Ron. Unhealthy diet and physical inactivity contribute to around 30% of preventable morbidity and mortality from non-communicable diseases. Excessive intake of saturated fatty acids, trans fatty acids, along with a higher consumption of salt and sugar are risk factors for hypertension. And these include various other cardiovascular diseases. We are joined by a dietitian, Natalie Matt, who's going to educate us about the importance of good nutrition when it comes to managing hypertension. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us once again on Shape Your Life. Thank you. Today we talk about hypertension and it's, as we know it's a silent killer known as such, you know, because it affects so many people and many people don't know. What role does poor food choices play in increasing our risk for this potentially serious heart disease? This is a really good question. Lifestyle and diet are two of the most important modifiable factors that means we can do something about them that help to improve heart health. The big ones from a diet perspective are that we want to make sure that people are getting as little salt as possible and then from a lifestyle perspective we want to make sure that they are exercising regularly and those two things plus some other dietary factors will massively drop your blood pressure and improve your heart health. What are the culprits that provide us with the most salt in the general food that we eat in South Africa? You'd be surprised by the foods that give us a lot of salt. Bread. Wow some of our margarine, staple foods that we eat every day, including things like stock powders, but also things that we buy ready-made and a lot of our snack foods. So for example, if I'm buying some chips on the side of the road, if I'm buying takeaways, often foods made outside of our home use much more sugar, fat or salt than we would use in our kitchen at home. So in a nutshell, how do we cut out the salt? cook at home and when we cook at home what I would like people to do is if they want to use salt use salt in their cooking but take the salt cellar away from the dinner table some people will complain that this means I don't have any flavor in my food you can have flavor in your food use fresh herbs use spices like your curry powders like cumin like paprika and then what people can also do at the end of cooking is just squeeze over a little bit of lemon and lemon helps to just bring the flavor out what we also want to make sure we're doing is that if I'm using soup powder or a stock cube inside my dish that I don't also add salt because the soup powder and stock is already very salty and when I then go and salt it more it's like using salt twice in one dish. Now when it comes to salt mm. is it true that if you add one shake of the salt shaker mm. you get used to that and if you add another you crave more absolutely. so you keep on adding more and more shakes of the salt shaker to your food. Yes absolutely so we develop a certain preference for salty food and when we drop the amount of salt that we are taking in our diet for the first little while the food is going to taste bland but what happens is 
our taste buds start to taste the natural amount of salt that is inside food. So as I said, there is food, uh, salt inside ready-made foods like bread, for mm. example, but there is also a tiny amount of salt inside fresh fruits and vegetables. And when we reduce the amount of salt that we eat on a regular basis, we are better able to taste the natural taste of food, including the salt inside the food. And so we develop a preference for less salty food when we over time reduce the amount of salt that we are using. So I know in the beginning the food tastes quite bland and it tastes like it needs salt but in time our tongues get used to tasting the natural level of salt in the food. Now we know that the Heart and Stroke Foundation is championing a cause for a long while now mm. to mitigate the risk of hypertension in our children. Yes. Now many people associate hypertension with an adult or an older person's disease mm -hmm. or condition but it's affecting younger children. Why is that and what can we as parents do to begin to eliminate that concern? When children gain excessive amounts of weight, they have the same problems as an adult gaining it, an excessive amount of weight. So you will see blood pressure issues, you will see blood sugar issues, and we don't tend to look for these things in children, and so it is the importance of maintaining whenever I see a child, I always want to address the diet of the child with the diet of the family because we should never put our children on diet. Our children should be eating what mommy and daddy are eating and if mommy and daddy are making healthy choices, the children will also be making healthy choices. But it is true that if I have a genetic predisposition to high blood pressure because for example my mom and dad also have high blood pressure, I might develop high blood pressure and so we will look for the same risk factors in children as we will in adults but we know that South Africa has an increasing number of overweight and obese children and that is one of the on switches for high blood pressure. Natalie, thank you for so much for joining us in Shape Your Life and sharing your wonderful insight as always and literally making it accessible to us to understand but it's up to us to implement into our lives. Thank you. We visited Dr. Shivel from the Headache Clinic to find out more about migraines and cluster headaches. Dr. Shivel, thank you so much for joining us on Shape Your Life. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Now, when it comes to dealing with headaches, you know, you get them. People get them now and then, and you yeah. know, you know, that's acceptable depending on you know. Yeah, are you dehydrated, not dehydrated, stress and tension, etc. Yeah. But you do get the really severe ones. Yeah. And when it, at what point should people say, enough now, stop this over-the-counter medication, I need to see a specialist? Well, if you are taking regular medication, uh, I mean, if you had a pain in the chest, you wouldn't just take painkillers, you'd go and have it sorted out. And fortunately, we can. We can help most people with headaches without medication. So, as I said earlier, if you get the odd headache from a late night or you didn't mm. sleep or you drank too much or whatever, uh, that's one thing. But if you actually, so if it's affecting your quality of life, if it's affecting your work, if it's affecting your family relationships, uh, then you have to do something about it. And the problem is that a lot of people think, oh, well, headaches, it's just a normal headache. Yeah. There's no such thing as a normal headache. I've never had a headache in my life, mm -hmm. so I don't get normal headaches. Okay. So a headache is a headache. It's a headache. It's not normal. Now, what about this thing? You know the old wives' tales that if you have a headache, you've got to press between your thumb and your index finger, and other people say, no, you've got to push, put pressure on your temples, um, and others are like, no, put pressure behind your neck. Now, I understand that they might be you know, trying to uh, impact those muscles that might be a little bit mm -hmm. tense, but it's old wives' tales. You have the science to back it. How true is it? Okay. There's a, a spot here where sometimes if you press it, it actually helps the headache. I don't know how it works, but it does. Okay. Some people find that there is a spot there where they press and it helps the headaches. Mm -hmm. That's probably a muscle thing. Here, it's been written in the journals, if you massage your temples for 10 or 15 minutes firmly, very often, it can help. So. These old wives' tales do have some substance, and in fact, there's another one. Okay. Some people tell us that their grandmother told them they must tie something tight around their, their, yeah. their, their head. Yeah. Well, that, there's, a, there's a very good reason for that. There are arteries, blood vessels in the skin, 
that sometimes these small arteries, they stretch open, they dilate, and that causes pain. When you tie something around here, you close them off so the arteries can relax. Now, when it comes to the most of your headaches, mm -hmm. are they the cluster headaches? Yes, sir. Cluster headaches, just for your listeners, your viewers, are also known as suicide headaches mm -hmm. because people commit suicide instead of having this terrible pain. It's the worst pain known to humankind. Fortunately now, here in South Africa, and this is the only place in the world, mm -hmm. we can now treat cluster headaches and prevent them from happening permanently. And we're getting people coming from all over the world for treatment for cluster headaches here. It's very, very exciting times. Yeah. And we've just developed a new instrument which makes the procedure a lot easier. But that's amazing because you've been involved in this research and it's, it's actually now been proven that it works. Yeah. So what is this procedure that it involves that helps release the, the pressure or the pain from the cluster headache? Well, it's interesting. There's an artery, a blood vessel behind the top jaw, mm -hmm. up there somewhere. And when it swells, it presses on a nerve underneath the eye. And that causes this terrible pain. So if you close that artery permanently, and fortunately you don't need it. It's okay. like the tonsils, yeah. the appendix, the wisdom teeth, the adenoids. You don't need them. You can close them permanently and then the cluster headaches go away. That's it. Wow. Finished. So literally you're saving people's lives. Because I've heard horror stories of people putting shotguns to the head and pulling the trigger. Absolutely. Others knocking their heads with hammers because it's so painful and unbearably so. Yeah, one of the, one of the ways one diagnoses cluster is that the patients tell you that they, when they get an attack they walk around and bang their heads on the wall to try and distract from the pain. And I think it was in 2013, they did some statistics in America and they found there were about 10,000 suicide attempts by cluster sufferers. We don't know how many were successful, fortunately I think very few, but people tried it and they do sometimes succeed. What would your final tips be for those individuals who might be suffering from the, 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 the publicly known migraine? Okay, well, look, there are a few things people can do if they're lucky. Some people, if they're dehydrated, as you mentioned earlier, if they're dehydrated, it brings on, it's a trigger. Mm -hmm. So those people, if they recognize that they've got that trigger, they must just not be dehydrated. They must drink frequently. Other people, if their blood sugar level drops, that brings on a head, that's a trigger. Well, then they must be careful not to have very sugary or uh, um, what they call high GI foods which raise the blood sugar level quickly and then drop it. It's when the blood sugar level drops that brings on it. So they must stick to maybe more small meals a day and with what's called low GI foods. And if people want to know about GI foods, they can come onto, they can phone us or get onto our website, we'll give them a list. There are other things. Um, there are certain food triggers that work in some people. For instance, one person might have a bar of chocolate and it brings on a... Well, then they know that they've got to just avoid okay. it, you know. But there's nothing much else one can do. So it's being conscious about certain triggers that might affect you. Yes. And if that doesn't really help, come and find you at the headache clinic That's and see how way. we can help That's them. That's the only way, yep. Dr. Shevel, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on this amazing new procedure, the world's first. Thank and you. And I'm sure you're going to be putting smiles on many people's faces that suffer from cluster headaches. Thank you very much. It is very exciting indeed. Hypertension is known as the silent killer, but it affects children as well as adults. So we all need to eat healthy and exercise to manage our blood pressure. Don't forget, you can keep in touch with us by sending an email to shapeyourlife at ann7.com with all your health-related queries or topics that you would like seeing being discussed on the show. From me, Ronald Avergy, and the Shape Your Life team, see you next week.